Well, good morning, Living Water. Good morning. You're the 11 o'clock, which means that you are the awake service. <laughs> you're caffeinated, you're fed, you probably got to sleep in a little bit. We want to welcome our online audience. So if you're joining us online, welcome. You are a part of us, and we're so thankful that you're with us. I love your church. Um, I love your pastors, I love your staff, I love the, um, I think you guys call them the campuses that you guys have in Lacey and in Yelm, and uh, your leaders here, uh, Fawn got to tell you, I work with a lot of different leaders uh, throughout the U.S., and um, so you come in contact with all kinds of situations, and some that are not so pleasant, and some that are really pleasant, but you get to see the quality of a leader when they're squeezed. I mean, pretty much anybody can stand in front of a group of people and make something look good. But when you're under pressure, what comes out is the character, the integrity, the substance of who that leader is. And your pastors and their extended team here in this place, under pressure, are leaders who are godly, who are sensitive and attentive and tuning in to the frequency of the Holy Spirit and seeking to be obedient unto God before anything. And I want you to know that. You're in a safe place. You are in a good place to grow, to be discipled, to be shepherded, and to flourish. Uh, Today we're going to be in the book of Habakkuk. It is a minor prophet book. Um, You don't get to be hearing a lot about the Minor Prophets because they're not very famous or well-known. But we're going to talk about the Minor Prophets today. Anybody watch sitcoms? Yeah? Yeah? Like any um, Dick Van Dyke fans? Wait, you're way too young for that. (laughs) What about Seinfeld? Frasier? A couple? Okay. What about Friends? Big Bang Theory? Ah, Big Bang Theory fans. Okay, my daughter is a Gilmore Girls fan, except for for her, it's a vintage throwback show. So rude. And so she sends me these clips all the time, and she's like, Mom, you're just like Lorelai. Oh my gosh, that's totally something you would say. I'm like, I don't know if I'm offended or if that's a compliment. I'm not totally sure there. Uh, But what I love about a sitcom is in roughly 30 minutes or one hour, you get introduced to all the characters, There is total character development, there is a storyline, there's some tension that occurs, and then by the end of that 30 minutes or an hour, there's this wonderful outro music that's playing and everyone is singing along and we are off because it's all been buttoned up nice and neat and we're going on to next week's episode. I so wish that my journey with God is like a sitcom. I wish that within 30 or 60 minutes, All of the characters would get introduced, the plot would get unfolded, a little bit of tension would occur, but then it would all be buttoned up, nice and neat, looking for next week's episode. Unfortunately, that is not how it works, and I find that totally rude. I mean, it's just really inconvenient, frankly. I think that when I get to heaven, I would like to ask God about why did we do it this way, because I really wanted it to be more like a sitcom. In any case, we are going to be in the book of Habakkuk today, and basically, I'm going to give you a little bit of backdrop about what the book of Habakkuk is like. So there are major and minor prophets in the Old Testament. If you have a physical Bible, that means about two-thirds of the way through the book, you are going to be hitting uh, the major and minor prophets. There's four major prophets, so this is Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These four guys are major league. They get lots of airtime. Uh, I live in Texas, and so we have, have um, where we live, college football is greater than professional football. And so people are really big about college football fans, and so many times you will see college athletes who are coming back for a fifth year because they are making so much money in NIL deals. And this is what the major profits are like. These are the NIL deals, front running, lots of airtime kind of guys. Then you've got these lesser well-known minor prophets. And there's 12 of them. They're short little books. And Habakkuk is number eight in the minor prophets. Not as famous, not as much airtime, not as cool, and definitely no NIL deals. In any case, still just as transformative. So we're looking at the book of Habakkuk. And this is a time uh, in the story of Israel where Habakkuk lives in southern uh, Judah, which is a part of where God's people are kind of um, inhabiting. And it's a really not great time for God's people. 
But Habakkuk is a unique minor prophet book in as much as Habakkuk as a prophet never delivers a message to God's people, which is sort of the essence of being a prophet. You're typically delivering God's word to God's people, but the book actually records a conversation between God and Habakkuk. And so we get to kind of eavesdrop into what this conversation is like. And it basically goes something like this. God, I'm super frustrated. I don't see you working. What on earth are you doing? Three chapters. Chapter one looks like wondering, where is God at? Are you still paying attention? Do you not see what is happening? Chapter two is a little spicier. It's a little more frustration. There's some anger. There's some lament. And then chapter three, we get into this place of praise. The name Habakkuk actually means, it's translated to wrestle or to embrace. And we're going to talk about what it looks like for you to wrestle And hopefully come to a place of embrace when you ask yourself the question in your own life, God, where are you at? Now, you won't say this because you're in church. And we all lie when we come to church. But if we were sitting in your living room and you were to get real honest, you might confess to me that you actually would question where is God at in your own life? Where is God at in your failing marriage? Where is God at in the diagnosis? Where is God at when your kid walks away from the faith? Where is God at? Fill in your own blank. And I want you to know that it is okay for you to wrestle. It's okay for you to doubt. It is okay for you to be in your frustrations because the God that we serve is not insecure. The God that we serve can handle all of your fears, all of your doubts, all of your frustrations. And we see in Habakkuk this man who wrestled with God. He questioned God's manner of interactions or lack thereof with humanity. Habakkuk had deep consternation for God's lack of intervention on behalf of God's people. Have you ever felt frustrated because you don't see God moving on your behalf? It is not a sitcom. You are sitting around waiting for the outro music, for it to all get buttoned up, and like, where is God showing up? He hasn't shown up just yet. If you feel hopeless, helpless, or powerless, if you're looking around um, at your climate in your community, in your city, or our nation, and you find yourself overwhelmed, wondering, where is God at? Take heart. Take heart. I hope that by the end of our time together that you too can find some hope in the God that we serve, some hope in the promises he has given, and some hope for your life today. Uh, Have you guys ever been to the Seattle Space Needle? Yes. Okay. So a couple years back, uh, my family and I were in Seattle, and uh, they thought it was a brilliant idea to buy tickets to go visit the Seattle Space Needle. And so because I'm a good mom and wife, I went along. But here's the deal is I have a fear of heights. And um, I get claustrophobic, and I sort of have these really weird idiosyncrasies that just kind of emerge. But the plot twist is I constantly put myself in environments where I am in really tall spaces and places or in really tiny spaces and places. So it works out great. And so my family, um, my husband, who's right here, and our three children, I'm going to tell you how cruel they are. (laughs) Yeah, they're awful. We go up in this elevator, and it's small, and there's lots of visitors, and I already feel claustrophobic. So I'm sitting in the corner with my eyes closed, just breathing. (sighs) 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 Like trying not to have a panic attack. The elevator doors open, and my husband and my three children get ushered out with glee and joy and just delight. And they're like, yes, this is awesome. If you've ever been to the Space Needle, it is not awesome. It is a porch that is clear plexiglass, like 30 stories above the city of Seattle. And all I can think is there is no way I'm going out there except for that my dear cruel husband. The elevator door is open and he snatches my hand and he's like, come on, babe, it's awesome. And I'm like, no, it's not. In that moment, I was looking for a handle to hold on to so that I could wrangle and harness my fears. 
Now, I'm telling you that, but what does it look like in your own life when you have fears, when you're trying to find hope, and you're searching for hooks and handles to hold on to, and there are none? How do you have hope without a handle? Habakkuk 3, verse 18 and 19 says this, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Habakkuk is three chapters. And in these three chapters, it's all bad news. God essentially is telling the prophet that, hey, it's really bad right now, but it's about to get worse. And in chapter 3, we see Habakkuk praising God for who he is. How do you have hope without a handle? What does it look like for you to see darkness in your life, in your relationships, in your family, in your nation? What does it look like? When things aren't going according to plan and you're asking yourself the question, where are you, God? Where are you? It's probably not you, it's just me, but I've often asked God, where are you? I don't see you working. I don't see you moving. I don't see you intervening. I don't know, God. Hey, by the way, Wendy down here on earth, I know you're super busy handling the universe, but if you can fill it into your schedule, I would really like for you to focus and hone in on because in my tiny little puny life, there's some stuff. And I really am asking for you to come and intervene here. And I'm asking, God, where are you? Habakkuk asked these questions too. He was asking, God, your promises are not lining up with your people. Your people are suffering. And you're telling me there's going to be more? Are you kidding me? We had some friends, um, they're still our friends. No, we didn't have them, they still are our friends. Uh, but they had a child about uh, 11, 12 years ago. And at the time, they were a newly married couple and they had been praying in anticipation of conceiving. And so they had rallied us all to pray because they really wanted to have a baby. So we prayed. And then we found out the wonderful news that they were expecting. And so we were so excited and there was a baby shower and there was celebration and we were all ready to usher and welcome in this baby. And then when they went to labor and delivery, there was complications. And they had a really traumatic birth. They ended up spending about 45 days in a specialty hospital unit in a NICU. And they had a lot of severe challenges, not only with labor and delivery and the arrival of their new baby, but when the baby arrived, the doctor said, hey, we want to run some more tests because we think that there is uh, some things we want to look at. So they did the testing, and then they came back and they delivered news that your child was born with Down syndrome. And so for our friends, this took them on a journey where they were asking God, we had prayed for a baby and we had a vision for what we thought our family would look like. And right now there's a gap between what I hoped for, what I longed for, where I had set my heart for and the reality that we're living. And they began to wrestle with God. And then they began to move into this place where they were praying for healing. They prayed that God would heal their child. They prayed that God would take Down syndrome away. They prayed that they would have a different outcome. And when they realized that the healing wasn't coming in the way that they thought, they began to embrace. And as they embraced, that baby has changed their life. She's about 11 years old now. I mean, she is a spitfire. And they have launched a nonprofit that specifically focuses on helping other families navigate uh, Down syndrome, but also connecting them to resources so that when these kids go to school, that there is the appropriate support systems for their flourishing. Their life has now found purpose in a situation that they did not think would bring purpose. They had wrestled, they prayed, and then they began to embrace. And I got to just tell you, um, her mom posted a video of her, and so she's going to school in like a full Batman costume. And her mom's like, so like, um, what's up with Batman today? And she goes, I'm going to go get them all. <laughs> I was like, all right, <laughs> you're going to go get them all. But she's amazing. She's a beautiful, life-giving, wonderful child. But it was a journey for them to get there. 
You can wrestle with God honestly and still embrace a genuine faith in God. If you're here today and you've been taught that you can't doubt God, that you can't wrestle with God, that you can't question God, that you must just simply ex accept, I want to just tell you, you can wrestle with God and also have a genuine faith in God. The scriptures are full of paradox. The scriptures are full of what seems like opposing truths that coexist. I hope that you find some freedom in knowing that you can bring your doubts to our God. You can bring your fears to our God. You can bring your concerns to our God. You can bring your pain to our God. You can bring your frustration to our God. You can bring your anger to our God. Our God is not offended by your condition. Our God is not insecure about your state of being. But what does it look like when you're waiting in the dark? Have you ever had a dark season where it's just like, man, we all live in the Northwest, so you have a lot of like cloudy days. I live in Texas, we get like some. It's mostly hot. But have you ever had a dark season? Uh, my husband and I were making dinner, it's probably about a year ago now, and I don't typically answer my phone during dinner, but my phone rang and I looked at who was calling and I recognized the name and this person wouldn't be calling unless it was important. And so I was like, hey, I'm gonna take this call. So I picked up the phone and the other end of the line was a familiar voice that was very broken, uh, very fragile. And he said, Wendy, um, I'm not good and I need help. And so I said, what's going on? So he began to unpack where he was at and it was a really dark season. He said, I don't, I don't know what to do. I talked to my wife and she said to call you. And so I'm calling you, but I need help. And so we began to process and we began to talk. And one of the great privileges of serving in a role like mine is you get to come alongside of pastors in really vulnerable seasons. And so we began to process. And I want to tell you that this was a journey, but there was a framework to how he navigated this journey. Because on the other side, I'm here to testify that today he is planted and flourishing. They are ministering out of the abundance of the joy of the Lord, out of the healing that they received. But it wasn't always like that. From that phone call to where we are today in 2024 was a process that he walked through. And there was days where it was big feelings, big emotions, big swells. But then as he began to get some strength and get some healing, the emotions seceded. And then what was really dark became overcast. And then eventually the overcast, the clouds broke and the sun began to shine again. And he began to have hope. He began to have joy. He began to have a future. But that framework looked a little bit something like this. In the waiting, there was a wrestling. And in the wrestling, he needed help. And in the help, it looked like this. He had to have a committed company. He had people that were friends, church. They kept company and they were committed to his journey. They were committed to him. But he also had to have a covenant community. And I got to tell you, friends, there is a difference between a committed company and a covenant community. You need to have covenant relationships with somebody in your life. And I want to implore you that if you're married, it needs to be someone beyond your spouse. You need a covenant community where you are going to go through highs and lows. You're going to go through the seasons and chapters of life because when you fall, you need someone to be there to help swoop you up, to help carry you, to help bring you to the Father when you can't take yourself. But then he also needed to have some core convictions. You know, it's one thing to have faith on Sunday morning when we smell good, we showered, we look decent, you know, we put a little bit of effort to being here. But it's a whole other thing to worship when everything is shaken, when everything in your life does not look like the faithfulness of God is coming through. You need to have core convictions, and your core convictions are what is tested when the rubber meets the road. So when it all goes away, if you ever live a Job story, which I pray you never do, but if it ever all goes away, what do you actually believe? What are you actually building your life on? Jesus. What do you actually think? And how does that inform your transformation? What do you do when you're waiting on God? I got to tell you what you don't do. You don't talk. Uh, I... 
I think I was probably born to talk. My um, grandparents have an audio recording of me at two, where I have sat my entire family down with the Bible, and I am scolding um, my f entire family for spanking babies. <laughs> True story. And so uh, you can only imagine how this unfolded for my parents. Um, oftentimes at back to school nights, if you have kids, at some point in the early part of the school year, you show up at their classroom and their teachers parade you around and show you terrible art and you pretend to like it and they tell you about what will happen in your child's future over the school year. Well, my parents often heard something like this for every year of my education. We love having Wendy in class. She's a great student, but... It would be really helpful if you could help her stop talking. <laughs> She's a little chatty. I gotta tell you, I just found that connecting with my friends in school was more important than listening to the lecture. <laughs> and so I've always been a little bit chatty. But when you're waiting on God, there's no talking in the hallways. Just like there's no talking in class, there's no talking in the hallways. The hallways of your life are a dangerous place to be talking because why? You'll run your alligator mouth and then have to go back and clean up all the things that you said out of your emotional state when your emotions were in the driver's seat and your convictions weren't guiding your thoughts. Amen. So what do you do in the waiting? First, you open up your ears and you listen. Habakkuk 2 1 says this, I will stand at my watch station and I will look to see what he, God, will say to me. Where we have the impulse to speak, to post, I went there, to comment, maybe we need to have the discipline to open up our ears and take it to prayer and wait for a word from heaven. So before we speak, we listen. But secondly, we have to write. You listen, you write, Habakkuk 2.2. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. When we write down the word of the Lord, it becomes the boundary markers for our trajectory. We begin to see how God is using us. Oftentimes, I will sit and talk with people in environments just like this. And they'll say, I really don't know what my purpose is. I really don't know what God is doing. I'll say, have you looked over your shoulder in the rearview mirror? There's often a pattern to how the Lord has intersected your life over decades. And if you begin to make sense of those patterns, if you begin to write down where God has touched you, where God has delivered you, where God has transformed you, you begin to see a theme. And then you begin to go, maybe this is how God is using me. But that only happens when we write it down. Why? Because we forget. I can't remember what I ate yesterday let alone what I prayed six months ago, let alone what the Lord said in July. But when I go back through my journals, when I go back through my catalogs of how the Lord has spoken, I begin to see the threads of continuity over the word of the Lord on my life, and it strengthens and encourages me in the waiting. And lastly, is that we wait. Habakkuk 2.3, my least favorite, by the way. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it lingers, wait for it. It will certainly not delay. This is a real big American problem. We are not good at waiting. We pay thousands of dollars to go to the happiest place on earth to wait all day in line. Why? So that you can yell at your kids and yell at the people in line with you. It's crazy making. We're not good at waiting. When you leave here and you go to lunch and there's a wait at the restaurant, just watch people's faces. They lose their ever-loving marbles. We don't want to wait for anything. We want quick service, we want quick meals, we want quick food, we want quick, instant everything. And yet, when we look at the story of the people of God, there is a lot of waiting. Extended periods of waiting. So we have to learn how to discipline ourselves in some waiting. If it's God's time, you cannot stop it. But if it's not God's time, you cannot force it. If you try and force an idea that is not in God's timing, every door will close, you'll fail miserably, and yet if it is God's time, man, the only thing you are doing is catching that wave because nothing will stop it. 
Lastly would be this, is how do you find joy in the embrace? We're ending where we started, which is Habakkuk 3. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Here's the thing. At the end of chapter 2, the scriptures tell us that the Lord says to Habakkuk that there would be silence before the earth. The earth would be silent before him. And scholars have debated what this would mean. Why would God ask for silence? Why did he say that? And there's sort of two big uh, theories around this. One is that God was uh, frustrated and disconnected and looked away from the sin and the idolatry in his people. And that is a theory that some scholars hold. The second is this. That the Lord has heard Habakkuk. They've had this conversation and he says that there will be silence before me. Why? Not because he's disconnected, but because your God is mourning. You know, I often don't think that God mourns with me. I often don't think that God weeps over the condition of my life. But many scholars would ascribe to say that the Lord said that. Because he looked at the condition of his creation. He looked at his people. He looked at where they had taken themselves through their decisions. And he said, I gave you free will and you chose this path. And now the only way through is through. And so there will be silence because I too am mourning the condition of what you're living in. I too am quiet because I'm grieving for what you're going through. Because your God is compassionate. Your God is for you. Your God intimately cares about you. And because he cares, there are times that he too is mourning as you mourn, grieving as you grieve, weeping as you weep, sharing in the burdens and the labors and the toils and the consternation that you have over your life situations. Really, regardless of why the Lord answered Habakkuk this way, what we know is that it was a sufficient and satisfactory response for the prophet. Because then in chapter 3, he changes his tone and he moves from wrestling with God, from being frustrated with God, to declaring the promises of God, to reminding himself of what the Lord has spoken over his people of what the prophetic truth that had not yet come to pass, and by the way, bad news was still coming. They were still going to live another era of some tough times. And the prophet says, I'm going to declare, I'm going to worship, I'm going to speak to who you are, because you are unchanging, you are faithful, you are steadfast, you are the same God who was, is, and is yet to come. What does it look like for you to praise before the answer arrives? What does it look like to stand on the promise before the delivery comes to pass? What does it look like for your life story to be chapter one, two, and three, where you go from wondering about who God is to wrestling with God, to turning the page and going, I've got a new identity, I've got a new story, and I'm moving forward in a new future. Many of you, I've talked with some of you. You're in a turn the page kind of season. You are turning the page from who you were into who you are becoming. And I hope that today is a turn the page kind of moment for you. Where you're able to say, God, my life doesn't really look in full like the promise that you've given me. But I'm turning the page turning the page and I'm going to declare the promises are going to come to pass would you pray with me